Okay, friends. So I'm going to run us through a couple of different places today. Some of it is going to be new information. Some of it is going to be review. Some of it is going to be looking forward to tomorrow. And I'm going to try my hardest to kind of slow down and really develop some ideas that are can be a little confusing. So I had a fantastic question from Tom about the Ninth Amendment, because I know that we talk about the Ninth Amendment quite frequently when we're discussing Roe. The Ninth Amendment, when we're talking about Roe, let me find my little clicker here. Um, to remind us, it says, it's the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights that shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And what's really kind of fun about the Ninth Amendment is that it's a curiosity in case law. And I feel as though it's a, it's a worthwhile investment for us to investigate a little bit more what was happening the first time that the Ninth Amendment was kind of cited in massive reinterpretations of the 14th Amendment. And that would be in the Griswold case. So the Griswold case is a right to privacy case. I think we all kind of have learned that without Griswold as precedent, it would have been very difficult for Roe to have become, you know, for the right to um, abortion to be extended with happening through Griswold and the right to privacy. Where I want to clarify is that we frequently talk about the penumbras decision, right? These emanations from penumbras or shadows of different amendments. And that frequently is the language that we cite in class that is where this right is coming from. But I want you to think more of, those, of that discussion as a textual and a rhetorical support for the right to privacy, but it's not the actual clause that is used in the Constitution to um, point out this right. If you go back and you read the decision from Griswold, it's kind of unsatisfying. It's a 7-2 decision. There's a lot of hemming and hawing in terms of where the right to privacy might come from. There is a majority opinion. There's a couple of concurring opinions. And they can't nail it down. They're talking about mostly due process rights out of the 14th Amendment. There's also some discussion of the 1st, the 4th, the 5th, the ninth, the famous penumbra's quote, and there's also a hint in the corners about equal protection, just a hint um, in one of the concurring opinions where they're talking about equality. So if we wanted to really understand what clause is operative, it is the 14th Amendment due process. The Ninth Amendment, like I said, using it as, as a support for an argument, but there's this really interesting debate that happens after Griswold in which people will say that there is not enough discussion of what the Ninth Amendment meant during the um, amendment ratifying conventions in all of the states. Like the state legislators just didn't have a clean and clear discussion about what the Ninth Amendment meant. And so to be able to employ something like this idea that the Ninth Amendment implies individual liberties is dangerous. We see that in particular in a very famous testimony by just uh, by Judge Robert Bork, who, when he was um, he was nominated by Reagan as a Supreme Court justice, and he made this very famous quote that says, "I do not think you can use the Ninth Amendment unless you know something of what it means." For example, if you had an amendment that says Congress shall make no, and there there and then there is an ink blot, and you cannot read the rest of it, and that is the only copy you have, I don't think the court can make up what might be under that ink blot if you can't read it. If you're like, "What's an ink blot?" I mean, it, it's a stain, right? Like you spilled your ink. So it kind of illuminates this idea that there's just an inconsistent historical record on what the Ninth Amendment means. However, yay, scholarship and academia has done more research. We have more people who are more interested. They're going to state houses. They're going to courts. You know, they're going to places in which you have repositories of, you know, decisions and um, personal notes and things like that. And so what we have discovered in recent is that the Ninth Amendment actually was discussed quite a bit. It was used as logic in um, quite a few federal cases. The problem is that what our understanding of it is has become more complicated as we have had further understandings of what the 14th Amendment means. So if you go to my favorite author, Akhil Reed Amar is one of my favorite authors. 
But um, he talks a lot in the um, in a chapter called the Popular Sovereignty Amendments about kind of how we can frame the Ninth Amendment as it was originally interpreted. So he refers to it as the alpha and omega of popular sovereignty. If we take the preamble and we see that there's this explicit discussion of we the people, again, hearkening back to the Declaration of Independence, right? There's a lot of that we the people communal definition kind of stuff coming out of there too. We're going to pull it through to the, uh, to the preamble. And then he calls it a bookend, the omega, right? The alpha being the beginning, the omega being the ending. There's this ninth and 10th amendment, which they state the enumeration shall of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And the 10th amendment stating the power is not delegated by the United States to the United States by the constitution, nor prohibited by it to the United States to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So for emphasis, I have highlighted this consistent popular sovereignty-esque language. We the people, by the people, to the people, very much so construed to a communal understanding of what these things are. So how does he interpret this? He says, okay, well, if we wanted to understand what the Ninth and Tenth Amendment said, we should read them together. The Tenth Amendment says that Congress must point to some explicit or implicit enumerated power before it can act. So it's directing Congress to go back to Article I, Section 8 and say, okay, I can move here. The Ninth Amendment, which precedes it, is very related, but it's a distinct question of whether such express or implied enumerated in fact exists. So what does that mean? That means that, especially when we're getting to those implied things, that this, if, if we don't know, if it's unclear, if it's vague, what these things mean, we're reserving it always back to the community. So we have two main views on how to interpret the Ninth Amendment. There's this collective view. We've, we've seen symmetry in language with this before when we talked about gun rights. So we've seen this collective right of people to preserve their right for local identity and sovereignty. That is the prevailing interpretation up through the um, 21st century, the knocking on the door of the 21st century. Uh, actually 20th century, mid 20th century. So it's obscured by interpretation, right? Research is underdeveloped. And as we know more, we're kind of like learning, but also we see the fingerprint of this communal collective interpretation in cases like Baron v. Baltimore. If you wanna, if you wanna refresh your memory in Baron v. Baltimore, it is a case in which a guy who owns a dock in the city of Baltimore is suing Baltimore in a federal court because he is doc can no longer receive frigates out from out of you know bringing stuff in importations this is like the early 1800s because the city of baltimore regraded streets and all of that dirt got flushed down into the harbor and now it's too shallow so he wants to sue in federal court and the federal court is like no man like we don't have the right to move here. Uh, it's not, it's just, it's not explicitly stated. It's something that you have to go back and deal with in the state. So like that collective right is very much so alive in the Ninth Amendment. Individual rights though, is where we have turned our attention. So this is a prevailing interpretation of the 21st, after the turn of the century, 20th century. So what we're looking at here, especially when we're looking at Griswold, and other cases, and really in, 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 a, in a very real sense, when we look to the Warren court, that we see this shift from away from collective understandings to a personal understanding. And it's a way to preserve our substantive and procedural based due process rights of the individual from the government from intruding too much in our lives. Selective incorporation reinforces this, which is why I say that we really associate it strongly with the Warren court. Every time that we're making a determination that the federal government and the state government's obligations to the individual are the same, we're stripping that right away from collective interpretation, a collective, a limitation on behalf of the state or the collective um, locality, and we're handing it over to the individual. So we talked a lot about last class, how that's a good and bad thing. There's like pros and cons to that. 
Um, and again, just to kind of prove a point that this is an open interpretation, go to a quote from Kurt Lash out of an essay called Of Inkblots and Originalism, where he says that all of this historical evidence reflects an original understanding of the Ninth Amendment as a federalism provision protecting the people's, people's, right, not person, but people's retained right to local self-government. It turns out the founders were indeed committed to the protection of natural rights, but they were even more committed to leaving the protection of such rights to the people of the state. So he wanted this protection, the sword for individual rights to be handed over, according to Kurt Lash, to the um, local or state governments, right? Very, a very federalism-esque perspective. Now, we had talked previously about how the role of the courts have gone from being passive, where they're nullifying laws, you know, um, to the point where I had mentioned that I don't think anybody at the art, at the constitutional ratifying conventions were saying that they didn't expect for their for the courts to nullify or to void certain actions. It's kind of implied in the supremacy clause, but that's a very passive just removal. Whereas over time we have a much more active court that is not just removing laws, but it's reinterpreting, right? We see more manipulation by the hands of our justices in terms of what these things mean. And in part, and in large part, it has to do with the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment allows the courts to view all of these rights in a completely different manner and to take a much more active role in ferreting out and trying to find the differences between when the local government should determine all kinds of manners of things and when we have to leave it for the individual. And I just want you to look, I mean, again, think of that Warren Court. How many times are they employing the concept of substantive and procedural due process rights? How many times are they looking at equal protection clause, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today because I want to I want to make sure that I'm setting some groundwork for next class. I mean, they are really and, and, and a lot of times they're talking about them at the same time. They are really, really actively involved in reimagining and reinterpreting what it means when we are saying we're delegating powers to the national government. Right. Very much so. So I know you're asking, why does this matter? We get it. Griswold is a 14th Amendment due process case, but there's a discussion of the Ninth Amendment, but it's not really, you know, it's not the controlling portion of that case. What does it matter? So it's important to remember that privacy, predetermination, all of these things, they're rooted in the Ninth Amendment. They're, they're rooted not in the Ninth Amendment. They are referenced, right? It's, it's more evidence. But it's not the primary argument that's being made. And the primary argument for all of these rights is the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. So this second founding is going to help us, if, we're, if we keep that in mind, it's going to help us negotiate some of the more complicated um, and enduring controversies that are continuously ongoing in American politics, so much so that they've moved from just an academic conversation, but they have gone right back to issues of morality and identity and humanness. And it, it's, it's a part of our culture. We might call it a wedge issue that would be used to try to find the division or the cleavage in a population so that one party can kind of find ways to galvanize a base around an issue. I mean, it, it's, it's something that if we look at it, we might be surprised because it's not something that the federal government, if you understand how rights have, or I'm sorry, how powers have been delegated between federal and state governments, it's not something that's like on its face a federal issue. You see it all the time. So I want to make sure that we come back around to the due process clause in the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause because they're both going to be at play when we start to have our conversation in a little bit. And I want you to remember that there are some, you know, we have our due process. I kind of was trying to think of a good way to simplistically refer, ha like have a concept or a mnemonic device or something along those lines to help you keep procedural and substantive apart. And it's not perfect, 
but it kind of works. So I think of procedural as process, as verb, as action. So verb, right? Like it's something that's happening. Whereas substantive is very much so more like a noun, like it's a thing, right? And um, so that might help us kind of keep them separate, maybe. Equal protection though, is another standard, another legal standard that could be standalone or it could be threaded in with due process where we're looking at situations in which the federal government is drawing a line of distinction between one class of citizens and another class of citizens and the effect that that law, that, that very drawing of a line between two classes and then what one is eligible for and one is not eligible for, what effect that has. We have a federal guarantee, uh, sorry, a constitutional guarantee that everybody should be treated the same. If you go to the 14th Amendment, that limitation is placed on the state governments, but we have this process of reverse incorporation in which we go back over that bridge of the due process clause in the 5th and 14th Amendment because they're so similar. And we have found a way through the courts to be able to bypass the need to write a for a a equal protection clause for the federal government. So what the, the basic idea here is that if we are holding the states to, you know, a, a, national, a, a national standard of substantive and uh, procedural due process, it wouldn't make sense to have the states beholden to equal protection, but not the federal government. So that's kind of how that works. And there's three things, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis. So this is, I mean, it can be employed for equal protection, you know, sometimes it gets a little squishy, right? But what we're looking at here, we also could see it employed for due process. Anytime the government is making a distinguishment between one group or another, we have to look and consider, well, what is that boundary? What is that line of demarcation about? And if it's about racial issues, national origin issues, religion, and I'm going to throw gender issues in there too. This one is a little more controversial, but there are legal scholars out there who think that Obergefell kind of brought the issue of gender discrimination up to the same position. Others might say strict scrutiny, others might say rational basis. It's, it's kind of an undetermined, <laughs> it's, it's like a point of controversy we're still trying to figure out. Um, but the court hasn't been very clear. So this idea here is that when the government makes this determination, the they have to prove to a court, to a judge, they have to go before the judge and make an argument that convinces that judge that yes, I can answer yes to all three of these factors. And if I can answer to yes to all three of these factors, then that law can continue, even though I'm recognizing it still creates a suspect classification between one group of citizens and the next. So strict scrutiny has to have three components that the federal government has to, or the state governments have to prove. The first thing is they have to prove that whatever is being legislated on is a compelling government interest. What does that mean? Core, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's an integral part, it's, it's the, the main purpose, et cetera, et cetera. It has to be crucial, necessary, something that no, like no one else can be able to achieve, right? The next thing is that they will look at the way the, the kinds of people who are caught up in this law and as well as what that law governs. And if it is written in such a way that it is capturing people in that description that is unfair or unnecessary, then it is, it's going to fail on this component. We call that narrowly tailored, right? So you're not capturing pieces of the, of the body politic that really shouldn't be confined in whatever that, um, whatever that law might be. And the final thing is it's the least restrictive, meaning that there's no other alternatives. There's absolutely no other way for the government to be able to affect policy outcome on this basis, right? So that's strict scrutiny. On the very, very opposite end is rational basis. And there, so long as the need is legitimate, meaning it's something the state has jurisdiction over, um, and it's it could be implied, it could be explicit, whatever, and it's rational, like it makes sense, and it's not arbitrary, 
Um, we see that the government has a much easier time proving this. And so this could include non-suspect classifications, non-fundamental rights, anything else not in those categories. Um, and they can make distinctions. So what might be something that would pass rational basis, something like in-state, out-of-state tuition, that D line of demarcation based on residency, um, something like whether or not you can practice law or drive a car in that state. It's not a, like to, draw, to be a driver or not to be a driver, that distinction, it's rational, it's legitimate, we wanna make sure that the roads are safe. It's not, um, it's not creating, it's not like exacerbating some historical harm, right? To my knowledge. So when the government is making or taking action that creates classification, they can be examined to make sure that they're not violating the 14th Amendment. So let's do an example that's a little bit out there. Um, it's, not, it's not where we are, but we're just gonna do a thought experiment to see how this applies, right? And so that is an idea that is circulating that Second Amendment rights should be lumped in under strict scrutiny, that we should have a case that holds the government anytime they want to legislate about taking away someone's right to have a gun that the government should have to run through the strict scrutiny test to prove that they are doing it it's a compelling need that it's narrowly tailored and that it's not overly broad so we go back to our case here with mcdonald v chicago right that's our second amendment issue it's a selective incorporation it's a due process issue um, we see that the city has made mo motions to not only regulate access to new firearms, but required registration of an old one. So that is a limitation on your fundamental rights, on anyone's fundamental rights, right? The court uh, ruled that the government can, well, I should say that the individual, that we kind of see that move towards an individual interpretation of who has to have, or who gets to have the right. Um, that gun ownership is selectively incorporated, that it's a protected individual right, so on and so forth. It's a deeply rooted American tradition, so on and so forth. However, it still opens the door to allowing the state to regulate gun possession because if you have a gun and you are using it in a way that is not for your own personal defense or for someone else near use defense and you are using it on the offense, then obviously that is confronting people's natural rights to life, liberty, and property, right? So that is where the burden comes in, is that you're trying to balance these two issues and being able to ensure people that they are safe, that they're not going to be robbed, that they're not going to be stolen, that they're not going to be killed or harmed. That's a compelling government interest. So the thought of making this a Second Amendment right is interesting because what it will do is it will make it much more difficult for the state to carve out protection for citizens from quote unquote bad actors. Now, of course, that's like a subjective term, just saying bad actors, I mean, bad to whom? But anyways, it's bad actors as the right to arms would be protected above or equally, in this case, with life and liberty of everyone else. So when we talk about strict scrutiny, what it does is it creates a protective bubble around some fundamental rights or some classification that you and I cannot control, right? Additionally, the due process clause and equal protection can be in play at the same time. And we're gonna to transition to talking about abortion. And what you're going to see is, while most of the case law talks about abortion from the context of due process, there is a really interesting argument to be made about equal protection. So really quickly, equal protection one more time. Again, like that reverse incorporation, it goes back to the federal government. We see issues about equal protection and when it comes to race, religion, gender, national origin, whatever you can think of beyond that. You see it in play both in federal law. We see it in actions of the executive. We see it in courts. It shows up in the most unusual places. We see it in voting political rights. We see it in equity for education, individuals with disabilities, economic disadvantage and race, right? With both Brown versus Board and the Individuals with Disabilities Act, or I'm sorry, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. You see it in affirmative action, which again, affirmative action is a, it's 
multiple, it's, it's mostly going to be executive orders and, and um, execution of law in the executive branch that is going to require the federal government, anyone who does the, did business with the federal government, to take into consideration race when hiring somebody or doing business. We also see it in education with Regents v. Bakke. Again, that's a case, a Supreme Court case. We see it with access to core government services, and you see that in the Civil Rights Act. Ability to engage in commerce, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus U.S. You see it in protecting free exercise of religion and the religion uh, restoring free, free um, refra, restoring free rel religious rights, religious, I forget what the <laughs> acronym stands for. You'll get it. All right. And then that issue of marriage right, regardless of um, race or sexuality, we see that with Obergefell and Lo Loving v. Virginia and, of course, abortion. And not only does this have implications for how the federal government has to work, again, huge implications in terms of what the states can and cannot do. So I don't think it's confusing or surprising that when I tell you the action taken by the courts, this is judicial federalism, is incredibly controversial and it very much so is picking at issues of states' rights, versus, you know, believing in the supremacy of the federal government to solve issues. It's picking at racial tensions. It's picking at gender discrimination. I mean, it, it's, it gets everywhere. And that very process, again, is fueling much of our deliberation about how to behave. So cooperative federalism, judicial federalism, defining who can do what under what circumstances, that falls under equal protection and it falls under due process and it's controversial. So some things that you should know about abortion before we turn into Roe. The history of abortion in America is inconclusive in terms of what the precedent would be. And precedent again, precedent is so important. It tells us what the standards were before so that we can have continuity in law. Can we break precedent? Absolutely, we can break precedent. Um, we can disavow stare decisis. However, doing so really has to make sure, we have to make sure that we have discovered an error in how we interpret the Constitution. So more about that, just food for thought. The history of abortion features abortions illegal, uh, featured abortions made illegal by the 1890s. Another way of looking at that was that prior to the 1890s, and especially when you go before the 1850s, the right to abortion, uh, women exercising the ability to have abortions wasn't illegal and it was utilized. So what the impact of the 1890s was, was that it was an issue of morality and it was an, uh, it was an issue of, especially after uh, World War II, replenishing human stock, um, all of these things. It didn't, what it did is it said it was illegal, but it didn't decrease the demand for abortions. It forced the demand for abortions underground. And what we saw going into the decades before Roe was that the medical uh, industry was, in, was increasingly perplexed. They were increasingly um, frustrated, concerned that women coming in to receive assistance on Monday mornings after they had gotten their paycheck on Friday and went to get an abortion from an, somebody who was not a medical licensed practitioner was an alarming enough that they saw trends and they were trying to change the public's you know, interpretation of it or how they felt about it. Were there, were there people who were anti-abortion from the 1890s to the 1970s? Of course there were. Catholics were anti-abortion, all these things. But you would be surprised when you go back into the limited information we would have about public opinion and in the writings of the time that there was not, it wasn't so, it wasn't so unequivocal, unequivocally an issue of morality. There were people who believed that this was an issue of healthcare and women making decisions that have a disastrous effect on their ability to survive. So these high rates, uh, high death rates, due to back alley abortions and limitations on social and political equality for women versus real concerns about morality and the abortion of the fetus and the right to life was what's at play even at that point in time. 
And the question became, at what point does a woman have a right to make a private choice? And any action taken by the state that is a barrier for a woman taking, for a woman who is not able to make a private choice is a procedural due process problem, right? It's an action taken that obstructs women from being able to have um, all of the things that are afforded to them in the court of law. And it really is going to be, it's, it's going to short circuit her ability to make that personal private decision with her doctor, with her family, so on and so forth. It's also, although you don't see this argument as fully developed in Roe, but we could also say that the very act of stating that women who have a right to pursue a pregnancy versus women who decide to have an abortion don't have equal protection of the law. And those kinds of arguments will develop later as the challenge to Roe versus Wade takes, um, you know, gets rolling. So I wanted you to see how like those two things can, can be present at the same time. In addition to that, I would be remiss if I didn't say that individuals who believe that, or communities who believe that life begins at conception and that a fetus is a human and therefore entitled to their natural rights, that there is a real conflict and they are not getting equal protection um, of the law because they have no one advocating on their behalf. So to some extent, the question of whose rights prevail does turn on where you believe life to be bestowed upon the fetus. The interesting thing also is that state laws, while they were limiting the ability for women to have abortions on the basis that a fetus is a child, and even still, like some of them said, some of the laws would actually go so far to say as you could have an abortion up until the quickening, which happens around 20 weeks. Um, but, you know, there are states that said no, under no conditions. And so in those states in particular, what they, what um, legal scholars would point out in the years before Roe, kind of in between Griswold and Roe, was that um, you didn't see continuity in the legal code bestowing personhood on fetuses in other environments. So things like you would be charged for um, an abortion, it would be a crime, but if somebody else killed the mother and killed the fetus, there were not consistent subsequent charges that um, on the person who was you know, the killer for murdering the fetus. It was just for the mother. Uh, there was no mechanisms in place in terms of dealing with a state law. If somebody, you know, if a parent passed away and you were inheriting something, it was only for humans that are not in the womb. So this creates a curious um, lack of continuity. And so, you know, when we take a look at this, I think that we, you know, we go back to this, I'm, using, I'm citing Joshua Craddock, who um, did a law review article on protecting prenatal persons, and he is going, he talks very much so later about his desire to establish personhood at conception, but he does cite that Texas could cite no case that holds that a fetus is a person within the meeting of the 14th Amendment, relying on other uses of the word person in the Constitution, including the qualifications for congressional representatives and the president, the court concluded that the use of the word is such that it has application only postnatally. Thus, therefore, could be no assurance that it has any post prenatal, uh, possible prenatal application. Relying on that notion that throughout the major portion of the 19th century, prevailing legal abortion practices were far freer than they are today, the court concluded that the person, the word person, is used, does not include the unborn. So kind of highlighting that issue of uh, a lack uh, or a problem in the law. And again, why does this matter? Because of precedent. Because precedent helps dictate. As soon as you change precedent, you are unleashing, you know, countless unexpected ways in which people will relitigate and they need clarification because it will have a domino effect on other corners of the law. So we turn to Roe versus Wade in 1973. And this is a case that was pulled together by a law student named Sarah Weddington and a couple of her friends in law school after she read some really interesting, compelling reviews um, post Griswold. And we saw lots of cases being cobbled together across the states that were trying to challenge and pull down um, abortion laws. But 
the case Roe versus Wade is the one that we learn about because it is the primary case that made it to the Supreme Court. It's actually one other case that was pulled into this as well, but um, it was the cleanest one because the it, because um, uh, Norma McColvey, I think that was her name, um, was actually pregnant at the time when this lawsuit started. So it kind of gets into some of the conditions for cases to proceed. Um, I think I've talked about them a little bit, things like standing, you have to be actually injured. You have to be in the process of being injured. You can't like say, well, I predict I'll be injured. Um, you have to, uh, it has to be an active case of controversy. It, um, can't have been resolved in any way and it can't be a political question or the basic four guidelines that courts use to make sure that a case can proceed. So um, she wanted an injunction so that she could go ahead and um, get an abortion. On, she wanted an injunction on state law. And the courts are going to rule that the right to make decisions between women and doctors is established, uh, is protected by the right to privacy under the Due Process Clause established in Griswold. However, it does an interesting thing where it creates three different categories in which women's rights will slowly give way to rights of the unborn child. Here in the first trimester, the woman's right is going to pervade over state interests on behalf of the fetus. That's weeks one through 12. When you get into the middle, so that's like 13 through 24, the government has the ability to regulate those rights, but she can still have access to an abortion. And then in the third trimester, because a fetus is viable at that point, the um, compelling state interest to um, regulate and, and actually restrict the right to abortion prevails for the state. And so the woman does not have that right anymore unless her health is at risk. So Roe obviously is going to do much for women who need assistance in um, economic and social equality. It will cut down on the number of women who die from botched abortions or who commit suicide because they don't have access to them, um, so on and so forth. But it is going to cause much disruption because this is such a fervently held issue of morality for so many people that this will become a constant source of concern. We see it all over the place. We see it with candidates running for office, for federal and state office. We see it show up in uh, political platforms. We see it show up in federal and state legislation. We see it show up when we're trying to confirm justices. I mean, this is a this is a litmus test in the uh, confirmation process. So how does this connect to the 14th Amendment? There's an explicit connection with Roe back to the due process, where women have that right to make those choices in privacy without having to go to court, without having to like out themselves, because um, that law prevents them, and that is a violation of procedural due process, right? They also have a right to privacy when it comes to bodily integrity, However, there are unresolved issues in balancing equal protection extension to unborn fetuses, and, and both sides can make arguments that involve both clauses. But this is the prevailing argument that they may make. So where does that come from? We see that Roe v. Raid, we do see that strict scrutiny test being employed on due process rights here. I told you that it can go either way um, in their choice to have an abortion or not because it kind of is pulling together identity. I mean, it's it's like, it's nebulous, right? I mean, yeah. Okay. So we get to Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood v. Casey is the last major Supreme Court case in which the court returned to the concept of whether or not women have a constitutional protection to, determine the, to terminate their pregnancy. And Planned Parenthood is an interesting case because it both affirms that this due process protection in the 14th Amendment should continue for the woman, that the controlling cases are about liberty, and, and there's the, you know a literal reading of the clause might suggest that it governs procedures by which the state deprives a person of liberty. The clause has been understood also to bring in substantive um, components, so substantive due process is involved here too because it has to do with fairness and you know, um, equity. So that's kind of like just opening the door just you know, a little bit to like equity, but not equal protection. I mean, we're flirting with that idea, right? 
They also will go on to say that these considerations begin our analysis in women's interest in terminating pregnancy, but cannot end it for this reason. Abortion decision may originate within the zone of conscience and belief, and it's a philosophic exercise. Abortion is a unique act. It's an act fraught with consequences for other. The woman must live with the implications of her decision for persons who perform and assist in the procedure for the spouse, for the family and society, which must confront the knowledge that these procedures exist. These procedures deem nothing short of an act of violence against innocent human life and depending on one's belief for the life of potential life that is aborted. I mean, we're really getting at this. Ugh, it's a controversial balancing act, right? We're looking at natural rights for both parties, whose rights prevail, at what point, et cetera, et cetera. It makes it so complicated. And this is why, again, there's a compelling argument made by women that this is a due process issue that like just saying you cannot have it doesn't give you the opportunity to be able to seek that out. I mean, it, it creates an issue in terms of ensuring that life, liberty and property are attainable, right? And that ability is short circuited when she, a woman is told no, right? It, it involve it, it impedes economic life, livelihoods and all these other different types of things. And that is controversial and it is conflictual with the prevailing argument that that fetus should have equal protection, that that equal protection should start at conception, et cetera. I mean, it, it's, it's tough, right? So Planned Parenthood reaffirms Roe, but it places conditional tests on state laws that impede the process of women. Kind of splitting the difference. You can tell the court's really having a tough time here. So only where state regulation imposes an undue burden on a woman's ability to make this decision does the power of the state reach into the heart of liberty protected by due process. And the critical definition here has to be, well, what is an undue burden? Is a 24-hour waiting period an undue burden? Is notification of parents in the case of a minor an undue burden? Is ensuring that the father has the right to say no to an abortion an undue burden? These are things that are being sussed out in um, the courts thus far, right? And certainly, if we're looking at this, the decision for some states to say, well, no, you can't have an abortion at all if you don't believe that life begins at conception that's creating an undue burden on a woman if she at no point can get an abortion. Um, so coming back to Joshua Craddock and protecting prenatal persons, he's going to make this eloquent discussion about how that's moot to him, right? It's, it's, not, it's not important. But the 14th Amendment use of the word person guarantees due process and equal protection to all members of the human species that preborn are members of the human species from the moment of fertilization. The 14th Amendment protects the unborn. It concedes the premise that they're members of the... Uh, if one concedes this premise that, um, that preborn humans are members of the human species, all that must be demonstrated is the term person in its original public meaning at the time of the first 14th Amendment's adoption applied to all members of the human species. That minor premise cannot be lingered upon here. Nevertheless, we should observe that whether states historically believed that the preborn specifically were members of the human species is not dispositive, so long as they believed all humans were entitled to protection under the 14th. So we really get to like, he's getting to this technicality, like, yeah, the laws were inconsistent, but if what, I mean, like, what is the essence of humans, right? And if we can evolve that understanding, then we can expand it to include the preborn under that um, protection, the equal protection clause and due process. So it's, it's so complicated. You know, if we think about this a really interesting way, and I'm using interesting because it's a nonpartisan way of saying anything, right? I'm not trying to like show my hand on how I feel about these things. But what's interesting about this is that how the law can use the same two clauses in completely different ways is what we're getting at here. In addition to that, as you see that court cases don't find purchase, they don't find effectiveness in one interpretation of a clause. It doesn't stick, the courts reject it. They will shift their attention to different ways of understanding it. It really is about how you couple together words so that it provides a compelling argument to justices. And I think that, 
you know, if we think about this, that's one of the really interesting things about law. I know that a lot of people are like, it's so frustrating because I would just like things to be the way they are, right? In black and white. But there are so many different people in the world, like the ability for each person to construct a compelling argument to really confront these, um, you know, timeless rights that we have that we see these natural rights they're they're found you know all over the world written into other nations um, declaration of rights and things of this nature that it gives us the ability to constantly reevaluate to constantly evolve and i don't know that there's anything really wrong with that it might be frustrating it might be enraging but this is a part of the magic of of what law is so are we revisiting this issue? Of course. I mean, like constitutional amendments have been put out there, like the human life constitutional amendment. We have, there's been people who have, especially Alabama, with the 2019 Human Life Protection Act, there have been this potent, this, this um, unfettered uh, actions taken by states to restrict abortion in the most restrictive of ways to say that it's an absolute right of the fetus and that equal protection should be given to them in the face of due process for the mother. Um, by saying no mother can have an abortion at all, right, as soon as conception happens. Now, that has there's an injunction on that right now, and we're looking to see if that goes before the Supreme Court. Should the political branches get involved? Should you look to the Hyde Amendment, which says no federal dollars can be used to pay for abortions? The Republicans want to expand that to Affordable Care Act. The Democrats want to repeal it. You've got the Sanctity of Life Act, which says personhood at conception. You've got the Freedom of Choice Act. I mean, it is, it's such an, it gets at everything that we've been talking about, right? In a very, um, in a very personal way for many, for, for people in general, right? If we look at changes that have happened in legislation at the state level since 2019, you see that states are trying to set up an environment in which the court is forced to hear this case again and is forced to reevaluate these arguments, the due process argument for the woman, the equal protection clause argument for the fetus. And Antonin Scalia, surprisingly, he's a Catholic justice. He was a Catholic justice. He had many kids. You know, he, we would presume, would be pro-life, pro not pro-choice. Even he is interesting. He says, I, I don't want to do anything with this, right? I will strike down Roe, but I will also strike down a lot of the opposite of Roe because I think that the debate with the, want, that both sides in that debate want the Supreme Court to decide the matter for them. One wants no state to be able to prohibit and the other wants every state to have to prohibit and they're both wrong. And that's how he reads the Constitution. I'm pretty sure you can figure out what he wants people to do. He wants people to do legislation. He wants that to be done by the people through popular sovereignty, right? He's very much so taking us back to that collective Ninth Amendment understanding where we're saying, ah, oh, we would rather make that determination because we, the people, and popular sovereignty should prevail on these issues. So this idea of privacy is, um, it really forces us to use the tools that we have developed in class so that we can clarify the matter and understand how this in turn creates controversy, fuels people's desires to be interested in Supreme Court nominations, in elections, in presidential elections, et cetera, et cetera, in American culture. So one final thought on the impact of precedent, and I just want to bring this in because this was just in the news last week. There was a case that was completely unrelated. Um, it was Ramos v. Louisiana. I talked a little bit about that yesterday. It's a Sixth Amendment case. We look and we see that in a surprising, shocking dissent, we see the two, two of the most conservative justices, Alito and Roberts, joining up with a liberal justice in Elena Kagan. And there's many people who theorize that if Kagan were left to her own devices, if this issue before them about the Sixth Amendment and the necessity requesting a revaluation of whether or not we should have a unanimous jury for felonies. If this had been something that had not as rich a, um, a track record in going before the court, or if we weren't in the environment that we were, 
Many theorize that Kagan wouldn't have done what she did. So she signed a dissenting opinion with Alito and um, Roberts that talks about precedent, right? We see they start the doctrine of stare decisis gets rough treatment in today's decision, lowering the bar of overruling our precedent, sets aside an important and long established decision with little regard for the enormous reliance on the decision that has engendered. There they are saying the implications of saying that we have to have a uh, universal or you have to have a like all 12 jurors have to say someone is guilty of something is going to disrupt future cases, previous decisions. It's going to cause there to be new decisions that are new cases that have to be run in the lower courts. We're making more work for ourselves, all of these things. And he said on top of that, there's this tradition that you should speak with a unified voice. Remember how I talked about Griswold where there was no unified voice and they had five different ways of interpreting where privacy comes from. Is it this penumbra decision? Is it just the 14th Amendment? Well, that makes for a very unsatisfying precedent. And Alito is pointing this out. Okay, so what's Kagan's long-term goal? Kagan is pro-choice. And Kagan is trying to, some theorize, strike an alliance that says we should not overturn precedent. We should not undo stare decisis because precedent is critical. And Kavanaugh brings us to the tea leaves. I don't know if you guys remember this, but in Kavanaugh's nomination, there was a question. Do you value precedent when it comes to abortion cases? And he said, it's standing precedent. I'm not gonna change it. Well, let's read Kagan's or Kavanaugh's concurrence on Ramos. He says, the legal doctrine of stare decisis derives the, from the Latin maxim stare decisis, blah, 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 which means to stand by the thing that decided and not disturb the calm. The doctrine reflects respect for accumulated wisdom of justices who have previously tried to solve the same problem. In 1765, Blackstone wrote that it is an established rule to abide by former precedents and to keep the scale of justice even and steady and not liable to waver with every new judge's opinion. Very much so what we talked about, right? The framers of our Constitution understood that the doctrine of stare decisis is part of the judicial power and rooted in Article Three of the Constitution. Writing in Fed 78, Hamilton emphasized the importance of stare decisis to avoid arbitrary discretion in the courts. I'm skipping ahead. The doctrine of stare decisis, here's where he turns, does not mean, of course, that the court should never overrule erroneous precedents. All justices now on this court agree that sometimes it's appropriate for the court to overrule erroneous decisions. So here's the T. It's in the footnote. So he put a little footnote in there saying reference here. And what does he say? He says, in Casey, the court reaffirmed what it would describe as a central holding of Roe. The court expressly rejected Roe's trimester framework. The court expressly overruled two important precedents. Why is it significant? Why would he bring up Roe in a footnote? Is he showing his hand that Roe is erroneous and that there should be some re-examination of its application? I mean, I know that we're, we're drawing conclusions and making inferences with not enough data, but I'm just saying, this is an issue that comes up in court. It's an issue that was there during the oral arguments. Like it is a live and active concern on both sides of the aisle. And if you've ever wondered, this is my little sidebar, like why court cases look so weird when you look at them from the Supreme Court, it's because they're bound. So when you go to the court, you can go pick up newer decisions. Um, you go in the basement, there's a window by the entrance when you walk in, and about a half an hour after they're done reading decisions, you can go pick up your own copy. Okay, so check for understanding. 1973, decision upheld the women's right to secure an abortion was based on the right to privacy, equality, due process, adequate medical care, of course, privacy, right, implied, implied. Which of the following clauses was most relevant to the Supreme Court row? You know this, it's due process, yes. So we did all the things, we're good. You are gonna continue on this conversation with Ramos looking in the tea leaves. It's a perfect place for us to pick up with another um, CAFRQ. I know that you guys are really going to enjoy that. And remember, quill.org, there for you to help you with those writing skills. I'm going to say thank you for watching. There are all of my lovely resources. Tomorrow, we are going to pick up with a further conversation about equal protection.
And until then, I am going to bid you adieu. Thank you for sticking out with me today. Talk to you soon.